And welcome viewers to the Daily Space Weather. Exciting stuff to cover, including comets, coronal mass ejections, new sunspots rising, and lots more. So thanks for tuning in to the Smash News Network, least busted name in news. Let's get to it. We'll show you some more spectacular imagery of that. We'll tell you if that coronal mass ejection is headed toward Earth. We've got two new named suns, two new sunspot groups that should get named later today. Uh, one right here and one up here in the northeastern limb. Let's go around counterclockwise and look at the southeastern limb as well. Bunch of filaments down there. Likelihood of additional coronal mass ejections remains at nearly 100%. Here is your southwestern limb, filaments over there as well, some of which hanging off the limb there in the form of prominences. And let's don't forget the northwestern limb, where the largest prominences are. In fact, that one looks like it just collapsed. Actually, part of it ejected as well. Is it headed toward Earth? We'll let you know later in the video. And let's take a look at yesterday plus today in SDO intensity gram. So some growth right here. Lots of sunspots showing up there. Uh, some setting here in the west as well. This one up here is on the alpha class. Looks like the umbra just split there right at the end of the video. This one down here is beta gamma class. And these are both, I believe they're both beta gamma class little sunspots there up in the northeast. So here is your SDO magnetogram colorized version from yesterday plus today. And before we go to volcanoes and earthquakes, if you'd like to support the channel, consider becoming a member of the Smash team. Of course, the best value is the gold annual paid up subscription. It's like getting four months of the gold membership for free. So let me just show you what that includes. Complimentary merch. So it looks like this. You get yourself a Smash Team shirt in the unisex design, or you can also get a hat or a scoop neck girl t-shirt. So help us out by supporting the channel at smashamash.com slash Smash Team. It's our own subscription services site. We've already explained to gold members, gold level Smash Team members, what the likely mechanism underlying the solar sunspot and solar polar field reversal cycle is. So help us continue to write the paper. Consider becoming a member of the Smash Team. Increasing the probability that these videos will continue to exist, remain publicly visible, and free for all to view. You can also support us via Patreon if you prefer. Patreon.com slash Smash Omash. All over the internet. At Smash Omash, of course. Three levels there at Patreon as well if it's more convenient for you to support the channel in that way. If you look at the links below the video, you'll also see a link to the Red Bubble site which is offering 20% off site-wide. Yes, 20% off site-wide on everything at the Redbubble shop. If you click our link, you'll find the product in order of best selling. So if you are putting off a purchase from our Redbubble shop, now's a great time. Save 20% site-wide. So there are the products in order of best selling. Today's featured product is our latest design, which we put out because reasons. Why is there no accountability? Because reasons. Why are people paid so much money for fraud, propaganda, and utter nonsense? Because reasons. Has your nation become a banana republic because reasons? Hopefully not, but in all likelihood, it has. Now, our finest days lie ahead, folks. The U.S. remains the best place to invest. If you're worried about fiat currencies, yeah. They're all bad, they're all inflated, and they're all worse than the U.S. dollar. If you're worried about Saudi Arabia trading oil with China in yuan or something instead of U.S. dollars, all they're doing is hurting themselves because those, quote, competing, end quote, fiat currencies are more inflated than the U.S. dollar. Enough said about that. Why do we cite facts? Because reasons. And here's some interesting facts. Mount Epi, which is an underwater volcano, has erupted in a rather spectacular fashion depicted in this image. We'll cover it here in a moment in our volcano rundown. So yeah, underwater eruption happening there 
at Epi. First, Shivaluch producing a 20,000 foot ash plume as it explodes on the Kamchatka Peninsula. Flight level 200 over Shivaluch. Please don't pole vault the caldera. Chikarachki exploding as well. 13,000 foot ash plume over Paramushir Island. Flight level 130 from Chikarachki. Tsunosejima exploding. Flight level 050. Semaru. It is erupting. No idea of the size of the volcanic ash plume. So at Vanuatu, they're expecting possibly a larger eruption here from Epi. So pyroclastic material rose 100 meters above sea level. Preceded the eruption, local people reported a steam emitting from the submarine volcano, a telltale sign of an impending eruption. So perhaps that's not done erupting. Let us know in the comments what you think. Public table has emitted some vapor and gas. No indication of an ash plume there. Headed down to Guatemala, Fuego exploding, flight level 145. It's a 14,500 foot ash plume from the exploding Fuego volcano. In Ecuador, three of the usual suspects, Sangue, Revenador, and Cotopaxi, producing a 19,000 foot plume. At Sangue, 15,000 foot plume at Revenador, and a 25,000 foot plume over Cotopaxi. It's a flight level 250, and intermittent emissions at Sabancaya. No indication on the ash plume size there. Continuing on to earthquakes, there is the past 90 days, as reported by Volcano Discovery, and we indeed do have a six magnitude quake. It came in just a couple hours before we streamed this video live. And there is a location of that. It's in a fairly populated portion of one of the Philippine islands there. There is a location of that six magnitude quake. It occurred at 1044 Universal Time this morning on February 1st. So let's scroll up the list. We'll cite any quakes over a five magnitude like this 5.0 at the Fiji Islands and this 5.0 at Tonga. Those came in yesterday afternoon and evening, 1607, uh, 1649 rather, at the Fijian quake, 1902 Universal Time at the Tongan quake. And it looks like a prime example there of a foreshock. So we had a 5.0 magnitude foreshock there preceding the 6.0 magnitude Philippine quake. Remember, folks, any earthquake can be a foreshock, so if you feel a big quake, don't assume that that was it. Also a 5.0 there at the Solomon Islands. Several quakes in the U.S., none large enough to comment on. Also, we saw a 5.0 at the Dominican Republic there in the Caribbean. So that's our earthquake rundown. Let's get back to space. Space, a frontier. These are the voyages of long-standing series of facts depicted on our channel. That's the last 24 hours of facts from SDO. The 171 Angstrom's wavelength is great at showing the cool lower corona. Those species of ionized iron have a tendency to very... They, they have a a very high tendency to align on those magnetic field lines. As you can see, that's why you see those loopy structures. And let's take a look at 335 plus 1700 angstroms here to show a little additional detail there. The 10.7 centimeter radio flux is currently at 137 solar flux units. So let us know in the comments if you think it's going to drop below 130. It looks like we have seen a support level here around 137, 136, something like that. The black line is the radio flux. The red line is the proportional data set sunspot number. No one not forecasting any geomagnetic unrest or geomagnetic storms at the moment. We'll have to see if we can amend that later in the video. We'll let you know if there are any CMEs headed this way. Those are coronal mass ejections. And let's take a look at Earth's geomagnetism. So there's the KP index at 0.67, geomagnetically calm conditions. And here's the last four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from space. Let me just bring that back here as we've, we've seen a ramping down of the solar wind in the past few hours. Also a significant coronal mass ejection 
at one of the Lagrange 1 spacecraft that measure the solar wind. That's the last four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from space, our geospace magnetosphere movie depicting magnetohydrodynamic pressure in nanopascals. Next Earth's magnetic moment from the ground. This is ground magnetic perturbations, geospace delta B changes to Earth B field. It'll show you the most likely places to see the aurorae, pipeline, railway, and power grid induction. Once again, to reiterate at the moment, it's a geomagnetically calm condition on planet Earth. So check this out. This is interesting. There was a brief, very dense cloud of plasma that made it through Lagrangian point one as picked up by the, uh, which one is that? That is the, uh, the ACE spacecraft there picked up a brief period of 183 protons per cubic centimeter there. Also a huge increase in the plasma temperature. So that was just a brief fleeting moment there of some very dense plasma making it all the way out to Lagrange point one, the location of the ACE spacecraft. It orbits that gravitational equilibrium point between the Earth and the Sun. Current conditions are not so exciting. 351 kilometers per second for the solar wind speed. Solar wind density just over 7 protons per cubic centimeter. There are your GOES magnetometers. They are in a more tight range there. Uh, a little lower highs and a little higher lows than the previous 24 hours. Next, the heliospheric current sheet it is south pole oriented, at least the earthly portion, and just about the entire south solar polar magnetism is oriented toward the Earth. So there you can see that in red, North Pole magnetism on the opposite side. It's pretty evenly split here at the moment. There's the latest image, and here's our line of sight field plot. Lots of South Pole magnetism. Like our thumbnail said yesterday, or our like our title said yesterday, welcome to the South Solar Pole. Next we'll move to coronal holes. And I would also note lots of South Pole-oriented coronal holes around the South Polar region, an indication that we've got a long way to go for Solar Cycle 25, as those fields have to make it all the way up to the North Pole and vice versa with the North Polar fields. We are years out, and you can expect just about no magnetism at the poles during solar maximum. At the moment, plenty. So here are lots of South Pole oriented coronal holes here. Let's just bring up the latest image. So we do have some North Pole oriented coronal hole right little one down here. All the rest of these are South Pole. South Pole galore. At the moment, that's the last 24 hours from SDO 211 angstroms. And next we'll move to sunspots as we like to be thorough, so we noticed nobody was covering what we wanted covered, hence these videos. So we'll have two new, same, two new sunspot groups likely named up here. It'll be 3208, should be that one, and 3209 should be this one. They're both big enough and have been around long enough to have names now. Let's take a look at those. That is the last 24 hours, and we will zoom in because that is insufficient detail for our highly skilled and well-versed viewers. So here's the close-up. Again, we'll have two new named sunspot groups up in the northeast. Several of those sunspot groups are magnetically complex. Let's take a look at energetic particles. We ain't got none. No spikes in the proton flux. Relativistic particles not showing up here, and the flare profile has dropped further here. We're down into a B-class background X-ray output. It's not going to last very long, folks. There are a bunch of roiling sunspots on the opposite side of the sun, and it's only a few more days before some of those start to rise again. So get prepared for the X-ray flux to come back up promptly. And let's take a look at the sun here in some of our X-ray bands. So this is ultraviolet light, but it is good at showing solar flares. That's 
94 plus 131 angstroms. Here we've put up 304 plus 131 angstroms. Once again, this is a great pair of, uh, it's a great composite here to show a lot of depth in the Corona. And we'll also show 131 angstroms by itself. And let me pause for station identification. I don't want to miss any videos here. And I think we have a 94 angstroms series of images as well. So let me put that up briefly here. There is the last 24, 94 angstroms wavelength. Why download it if I don't show it to people like you? All right, now let's take a step back and consider what's going on over our heads. Is space weather over your head? Well, then don't do it. Are you a channel who wants to cover space weather and has no idea what you're talking about? Just recommend our videos instead. Don't make a fool of yourself. So this is what's currently going on over Lehigh Valley. We've got a sunrise. If you're up before dawn, you might see mercury rising ahead of the sun especially if you have a low horizon and low light pollution and clear skies. Otherwise, you probably won't be able to see it. It's pretty dim. Let's do a solar system forecast. This is where things are today, and we'll advance this one week to February 8th. Here's where things will be in one week. It's pretty lonely on this side of the sun. No gas giants over here. Venus is catching up. Next, it's time to look at coronal mass ejections. So we've got limited data here from George Mason University. You can see these are grayed out, unfortunately. So Lasco C2, for whatever reason, not showing data. Let's take a look at Stereo A and Soho Lasco C3 at Lagrange 1. Because plenty of exciting stuff happening there. And you can see this CME happening. It looks like it may have an earthly directed component, but alas. It does not. It is off to the northwest. So that's a quite a spectacular CME. Unfortunately, a lot of the data there not showing up. Uh, that was from that huge prominence. I think that was the Dick Van Dyke prominence now making its way out into the greater solar system. So a lot of missing frames there, unfortunately. But great imagery of this comet. And of course, we've got some close-ups of that for you. So let's break out some more of our custom coronagraph images. Shout out to helioviewer.org. So here's that CME, and you'll notice that there is no halo here. It is off to the northwest, not likely directed toward Earth. And here's some more imagery of that comet. As it starts to move back farther out from the sun, and of course its tail changes direction, consistent with the, uh, the solar wind output, essentially. And there's some more imagery of that comet by itself. Good stuff from the Soho Lasco C3. Next looking at filaments and this is the ground based Cerro Tololo Hydrogen Alpha Telescope. Massive filaments here. Uh, I think we should name them. This one up here is called Stella something or other. The rest of these I don't think they're named. So it's a perfect day to name that filament. If you want to name filaments after living people, please do so at Twitter. You can't name them in the YouTube comments or the BitChute comments. But when it comes to space weather, filaments are super important. So name that filament. It is a hashtag on Twitter as well. So drop us a line there. Uh, tweet at us if you want to name any of these filaments. Maybe even take that image and 
put a little pointer to it or something, you know, edit it using your smart device or your computer or whatever. Name filaments after living people. And make sure you follow us on Twitter. If you don't have an account, why not get one? So here's the wavelengths that we started out with. This is great at showing filaments, 304 plus 193 angstroms. And here you can see the Dick Van Dyke saying bye bye to the solar corona. As magnetism and gravity decide who has won that battle. Magnetism won, gravity zero. In any case, that's what's going on the past 24 hours. How about the past about two and a half hours from the GOES-18? Here's the GOES-18 304 angstroms wavelength. Yowzers, that is a lot of filaments. So again, check it out. I mean, look at all those dark absorption features there. Those are all filaments. Also, we've got prominences in the southwest, the southeast, the northeast, the north, and the northwest. So likelihood of coronal mass ejection is very, very high. And name those filaments after your friends and foes, perhaps. Again, you'll have to tweet at us or comment on the post or something like that. That brings us to bonus features, starting with charging hazards. Satellites have clear sailing here at the moment. Electron flux here dipped a bit as we forecasted yesterday. Now we can expect this to come back up as we've seen the coronal hole high speed stream subside. There is the NOAA forecast and you can see if you watch yesterday's video you'll see I was basically right on with this forecast yesterday expecting it a little bit lower than NOAA. That's all a matter of being immersed in the data, folks. If you are immersed in the data, you might be able to make forecasts. And if you're spouting nonsense on YouTube, you couldn't forecast your way out of a wet tissue paper greenhouse. Continuing on to the one-year chart, we are in an operating range there for relativistic electrons. And let's take a look at the portion of the atmosphere where they're measured, the F layer. That's located at about 300 kilometers of altitude. It's the F ionosphere layer, the bridge between Earth and space, the location which we've seen the South Atlantic anomaly shift around thousands of miles in only a matter of a couple of weeks, and now oddly return to the South American continent. So there is your ionogram that's showing vibrational frequency in megahertz, millions of vibrations per second. We'll also show the anomaly gram to show back to normal anomalies, I guess, basically. So the South Atlantic anomaly is now back over the South American continent. Figure that one out. If huge iron structures in the outer core would need to move around in order for Earth's magnetosphere to shift massively, uh, how did that occur without massive earthquakes occurring? Let us know in the comments what you think. The South Atlantic anomaly appears to be back over the South American continent. You can see those variations there in the anomaly gram looking very obvious here. It went from the South Atlantic to South America to the South Pacific toward the equator and then back to South America. Seems like it might fly in the face of mainstream ideas about how Earth's magnetic field is generated in the first place. Again, let us know in the comments or perhaps Join us at smashomash.com slash forum if you want to talk about Earth's magnetic dynamo. There is a thread about it there. It is completely free. Smashomash.com slash forum. There's a latest image. 1300 ionogram, 1300 universal time anomaly gram. Great indication of where the South Atlantic anomaly is, right back to where it was. We'll also take a look at the total electron content forecast as we want to show our viewers the most likely places for GPS errors. There's a 12,500 mile run from your GPS handset to your satellite. The coupled thermosphere, ionosphere, plasmosphere, electrodynamics model shows you the most likely places to see GPS errors. And while we can expect to see some over North America, it is a lot better for GPS at the moment. We saw some massive errors that lasted probably six weeks 
and things are starting to look a lot more normal here with the total electron, total electron content forecast. We'll let that play through one more time as Earth's electron contents return to more normal levels where they're more concentrated around the equator at noon, the most likely places, statistically speaking, to see GPS errors. Next, we'll show the latest intensity gram and latest solar magnetogram before we go to the realm of meteorology. Let's take a look at these new sunspots. So there's one. That's beta gamma class. That one down there is alpha class. It was beta class when we did show prep, but at the moment, alpha class. Here's your rock back to show all the fields and sunspots. Most likely places for large flares would be mainly this group, but also as this group sets, it becomes a little bit more statistically likely to produce large flares. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And before we get to meteorology, take a moment to click our links. You can find links to this, the home page at smashomash.com and welcome to the neo-renaissance. Again, we've already explained the mechanism underlying the solar sunspot and solar polar field reversal cycles to our Gold Smash team members. You can find links on the home page to that as well as the merch shop, the forum, and lots more. So please support the channel. Increase the probability that these videos will continue to exist, remain publicly visible, and free for all to view. Press like, press subscribe, press share. Leave us a comment. Tell your friends and foes about us. If you're an influencer, have us on the channel. We'd be more than happy to perhaps have a visit. I would also note this. Look at how interesting this is. Exactly 133 views on yesterday's video and the day before. And then three and four days ago, exactly 195 views. I'm sure it has nothing to do with YouTube having their thumb on the scale or anything like that. No, no. No. They totally recommend us, and the hashtag system totally isn't broken, and that's totally not sarcasm. Press like, subscribe, share, etc. Check out our playlists. We've got videos that aren't space, weather, and meteorology segments, so check those out. Product reviews, ownage, food, and drink, and lots more. And thanks to our YouTube subscribers for tolerating the pathetic and putrid censorship on the platform. Next, we're looking at sea surface temperature anomaly and currents. So this is the weirdest place in the world in a lot of ways right here, folks. That is the Drake Passage, where the Pacific Ocean and Atlantic Ocean attempt to reach static equilibrium. And of course, you may be aware that warm ocean water takes up more space than cool ocean water. So you've got huge pressure gradients happening there. And uh, yeah huge currents flowing in between there. That's one of the most dangerous waterways in the world, the Drake Passage. And look at the anomalously cold and hot water there. Cold water in the South Pacific, hot water in the South Atlantic or the Southern Ocean near the border of those two bodies of water. We've also got very hot water around New Zealand, hot water in the Southern Indian Ocean, warm water in the North, I mean, cold water in the Northern Indian Ocean off the west coast of Australia, the equatorial Pacific, very cold, the northern Pacific, mostly anomalously warm there. And last but not least, we'll take a look at the Gulf Stream since we've got sea surface temperature anomaly and currents. And check out the cold water all around the U.S. coast, the Florida Gulf Coast, as well as the East Atlantic coast of the U.S. Very, very cold water there. And then we've got very warm water off of New England. So interestingly enough, and then we've got some very cold and warm water mixed together here in the Gulf Stream as it heads up toward places like Iceland and Scotland. Also Lake Michigan and Huron anomalously warm here at the moment with Ontario, I mean with Lake Erie, a little bit anomalously on the cool side. Anyway, that's sea surface temperature anomaly. I think we covered most of it there. Very cold water around the China coast. Very cold water there. Check it out. Very anomalously cool water. And the Mediterranean is anomalously warm. Also parts of the North Atlantic anomalously warm. Hopefully we covered that sufficiently. And if you think we've got some kind of a bias about it, I don't know what to tell you. We cite facts on the channel. I started studying climate formally 
in 1987 in eighth grade earth science. I guess I'm dating myself now, so let's move to the winds. So here's the wind scenario. We've got two strong lows here in the Southern Ocean. Those are the winds at surface level. Here are the 250 hectopascal winds, otherwise known as the jet streams. Here are the jet streams of the Americas. And thanks for leaving a comment, Steve Stevio, 8778. Here are the surface winds of the Western world. Surface winds of the Central world depicted. Yeah, it's a windy day in the Eastern Mediterranean. And these are the jet streams of Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. And let's move on. We don't want the video to be too lengthy. So here is clouds and fog over the Americas. It's still dark over about half of that view. So we've used 3.9 nanometer radiation. As clouds and fog emit radiation, that's how we view them when it's too dark to use the visible. Next, our weather.gov map. We're going to briefly scroll down so you can see the key. There is the key. If your location is lit up on the map, head to weather.gov and click your location. Let's do some forecasts since cold is going to be in the news. A big cold blast coming to the northeastern U.S. here. Some anomalously warm temperatures coming to Florida and Georgia. That's your 72-hour GFS Temper excuse me, temperature anomaly forecast in degrees Celsius. And we've got major ice storms in Texas. Large portions of Texas here expecting significant icing as precipitation shows up and lands on cold ground. When you get cold ground with warm rain, you get freezing rain. And you can expect some significant icing. This will cause some issues, likely in the Lone Star State. That's your 72-hour GFS pressure and precipitation forecast. Expect some ice accumulation there following those cold temperatures. Yowzers. Since some of that precipitation will, form, it will fall in the form of snow, here is your total accumulated snow depth change in inches for the same model, the GFS 72-hour. Still expecting a significant snowstorm there deep into Mexico. And let's take a brief look at the difference between the Euro and the GFS model. Using our windy.com app, there is the GFS forecast. There is the Euro forecast. There's snow coming to Mexico. And those are the differences between the Euro and the GFS model for the next three days of new snow. Windy.com's got a great mobile app as well. Perhaps check that out. Now we'll move to Lightning. To give you a holistic view of the weather in space and the weather on Earth. Do we have any terrestrial strikes in the U.S.? I don't think so. Maybe one near Houston? Near Beaumont, Texas? Nope, looks like it's too old. We'll, scroll, we'll zoom out and show the full map here. That is your... Real-time lightning map, courtesy of lightningmaps.org, powered by blitzortung.org. Looks like Germany has got some thunderstorms there in the northern part of the country. Also, Israel experiencing some lightning. Continuing on, here's our U.S. Doppler radar map. It shows vertical motion of water droplets and ice crystals in the air column. We'll focus on the lower 48. Here's shortwave radiation showing clouds and fog over croissant earth. And here is your water vapor map. You've got a bit of a blocking feature here, this dry mass of air. This is effectively a high pressure system, causing this air to kind of head up to the northeast. And that's going to cause some pressure gradients to happen here in the hot air capital of the U.S., Colorado. Yeah, the hot air capital of the U.S. So much hot air coming out of Colorado that, I don't know, uh, I believe your hot air balloon 
might just float on its own if you decide to build it up in Colorado. Anyway, here's your recap to close out the video, U.S. Doppler radar. Shortwave radiation showing clouds and fog. Last but not least, the water vapor map. That should clear up your Doppler if it's not providing enough info. So thanks for tuning into the Smash News Network least busted name and news. Please support the channel via the links below the video. Help to increase the probability that these videos will continue to exist, remain publicly visible, and free for all to view. In the meantime, I'll have been your host, Dan, a.k.a. smash o -Mash, signing off. And may that solar wind be at your back. Facts stated in this video suppressed because of their non-alarmist and non-propagandistic value in order to improve your online experience by big tech organizations. Opinions stated in this video are not necessarily the opinions of Smash News Network, least busted name in NAV.